Hi, I'm Tyler Fulce. I'm a nuclear engineer, a little over 10 years of experience in the commercial nuclear power industry. From engineering to operations to emergency response. I don't claim to know everything there is nuclear, but I can certainly share some knowledge. Today we're going to be looking at another one of Kyle Hill's videos called The Time We Nuked Five Men to Prove a Point. Not sure I'm familiar with this story. Let's check it out. On July 19, 1957, five U.S. Air Force officers and one photographer volunteered to stand a few miles behind me. Next to them, a sign that said Ground Zero, Population 5. In the next few minutes, <laughs> okay. a two kiloton nuclear warhead would detonate 18 and a half thousand feet directly above their heads. Why would these men volunteer? Okay, so right above. Well, two and a half kiloton, that's not that big as far as nuclear weapons go, so... They're probably at a safe distance. But in this incredible archival video of five men willingly standing underneath a nuclear explosion, we see something else. They're not even wearing sunglasses? That's kind of weird. If we get a nuclear explosion out in where this testing grounds typically are, you just want to wear sunglasses just in general. <laughs> Instead of destruction, not much more than a synchronized flinch. A few moments earlier, 65 miles northwest of Las Vegas, an F-89 interceptor had launched a two kiloton nuclear warhead directly above the heads of Colonel Sidney Bruce, Lieutenant Colonel Frank Ball, Major Norman Bottinger, Major John Hughes, Don Luttrell, and George Yoshitaki, the unseen cameraman. These mm. men were ground zero, population five, for a successful test of the world's first air-to-air -air nuclear weapon. That's fascinating. I'm not too familiar with air-to-air -air nukes. I guess that'd be kind of like the nuke they used in Independence Day to attack the alien ship. That's a... But this was a different era, though. Cold War America was most worried about a surprise nuclear attack from fleets of Soviet bombers. Okay, yep, yeah, because that's how bombers just massed. Like, during World War II, um, most air raids, and of course, a mass of nuclear-armed bombers. Um, this is the uh, Soviet Bear Bomber, um, one of its infamous uh, strategic bombers, including the one that carried the SAR bomber during one of those tests that he mentioned earlier that I agree was a big spectacle than an actual serious nuclear weapon that they would really use. Um, <laughs> because it would be such an easy target for regular interceptors, let alone these crazy air-to-air -air nuclear weapons that he's talking about. But yes, this was a dramatic shift in nuclear weapon doctrine with the advent of internet in intercontinental ballistic missiles. And before then, it was this old-school bomber era that didn't last very long, but this was a weird, weird time in history. Anti-aircraft technology at the time wasn't equipped to handle dozens of relatively high-flying, fast-moving planes. So in the August of 1954, President Dwight D. Eisenhower appointed MIT President James R. Killian Jr. to lead some of the nation's top scientists, engineers, and industry professionals in an effort to counter this potential threat, to develop strategy and technology that would make this aspect of the Cold War a little colder. 307 meetings later, a panel of 42 experts produced a 190-page document. I like it when Kyle shows his references that are primary sources here. That's a, that's a very good touch and a testament to how good he is at researching stuff. Titled, Meeting the Threat of Surprise Attack. During their four-hour testimony to the U.S. National Security Council in 1955, the experts argued that the most effective way to meet a thermonuclear-equipped adversary in the air was with nuclear weapons also in the air. Indeed, the report recommended that nuclear weapons should be the main defense against possible air attacks. That's crazy, isn't it? The era, of, but you can kind of understand where they're coming from, a just large group of bombers swarming in like that. Um, a nuclear weapon, air-to-air -air missile that just hits them with this massive air burst that they can't escape from. What's interesting is there's a lot of shift to using like massive amounts of drones because drones are very inexpensive. I don't recommend shooting nuclear weapons against a cluster of drones, but um, it's interesting how since it, you could make drones 
cheaper than you can make a lot of anti-aircraft missiles, you could overwhelm um, even a modern air defense system with, with this sort of tactic. It wasn't cost effective back then, but it, it's interesting how there's, there's discussions about that sort of thing now. Um, haven't heard any about using nuclear air-to-air -air missiles, and I don't, I don't see that ever happening, but just how to defend against a clustered air raid. The reasoning was simple. A single warhead of significant tonnage should be enough to wipe out an entire fleet of Soviet aircraft flying and bombing for Oh, that was a cool plane back then. It's got that whole retro-futuristic look to it. This is what the future looked like in 1960 or whatever. The council was convinced. That same year, development would begin on the McDonnell Douglas Air 2A Genie, a 1.5 kiloton nuclear warhead that could be fired air to air. But there was still a problem. The public. Rightly sensing that Americans might not want nuclear bombs detonating above their heads even in defense, the Killian Committee also recommended that an upcoming demonstration of the Genie technology be promoted to citizens as an advertisement of its safety. A nuclear bomb. What an era. And yet people, people did this back then to alleviate fears, but can you imagine trying something like this today? You know how fast that would get shot down? It, it would never even make it to these little um, papers or thoughts, because I'm sure even thinking of something like that would be crazy now. But it was just a, a different era back in, back in the 50s. Publicity stunt. They just needed some volunteers. Two years later, July 19th, 1957. F-89 pilot Captain Eric William Hutchinson fires a 1.5 kiloton nuclear warhead powered by a solid fuel Thiokol SR-49 TC-1 rocket engine. The engine runs for two seconds. Now traveling at over three times the speed of sound, the rocket flies for another 12 seconds. Hutchinson executes a dangerous high-G maneuver to ensure that he escapes the one- th I guess missiles back then were relatively primitive that you'd have to have this short fuse, short range rocket, uh, that's, that would be so danger close right now. <laughs> ...foot blast radius. And then, the genie was out of the bottle. There it goes, the rocket is gone. We felt a heat pulse, a very bright light, a fireball, it is red, the sky looks black about it, it is boiling above us there. That is fascinating. I, I was not familiar with this test, and in my career we talked about all types of crazy tests and experiments, but this one, different time period, but this was cool. <laughs> Just this glimpse at a different era of nuclear defense using a nuclear weapon, de um, <laughs> I guess double meaning nuclear defense, defend against nuclear weapons with a different type of nuclear weapon. That is... That is really cool. How is a nuclear weapon dangerous? It may surprise you to learn that what most people imagine to be the most destructive aspect of a nuclear weapon, the ionizing radiation and subsequent fallout, is in reality the smallest fraction of a detonation's colossal energy output. Thank you for saying that. Um, again, he, he is right that that is what a lot of people think there is. You'll even recall I reacted to some shorts that a lot of people talk about the most dangerous aspect being the radiation. It's not. It's, it's a big bomb. The, uh, so the thermal energy and the blast energy, what's interesting is the video I reacted to didn't even mention the blast, which he's showing 50% of the energy. And we're, we're just talking energy. We're not necessarily talking about what the energy does. So blast and thermal, blast will destroy everything. Um, within a small radius and cause widespread damage to other things. The thermal energy is going to set everything on fire. And the radiation, a lot of that is gamma radiation, which means it's just going to go straight through a lot of things. As far as causing structural damage, though, it's not going to be nearly as much compared to that other 85%, even if you consider percent for percent um, energy yield. I mean, that, the radiation's nasty, don't get the wrong idea, but everything that's going to be affected by the immediate radiation is 
already dead because they're killed by the blast and the thermal energy. What's really left is the fallout, and that just depends on whatever happens to be downwind of this blast. But especially an air burst nuke, it's not going to do that much damage as far as to the sur to the people on the surface. They didn't they wouldn't have gotten any nasty dose, especially because that was a small nuke and it was way, way above them. Glad he talked about that one misconception. That was good. And ionizing radiation only makes it so far in air as it collides with the atmosphere's atoms and molecules, yep. while fallout is of most concern when an explosion vaporizes a large amount of additional material, like terrestrial rock or sea coral. Therefore, a relatively small nuclear weapon like the Genie's W-25, detonating at an altitude six times higher than the highest building on Earth, did in fact pose very little threat to anyone on the ground. Fireballs would rise into the sky and cool, any minimal fallout would spread out as to become mostly harmless. A warhead carrying Soviet aircraft, on the other hand, would find it physically impossible to escape deletion, as a missile moving at Mach 3... Deletion. One other misconception I wanted to point out is it will not set off the nu nuclear weapons inside of the bombers. It will just destroy them, destroy the bombers. Uh, because a nuclear weapon has to go through a specific and precise ignition sequence in order for it to work. So contrary to what you see in video games and certain movies, you're just going to destroy the weapons and intercepting a nuke will not cause it to detonate like it intended to when it reached the target. Point three instantly transforms into a 1,000 foot wide sphere of air hotter than the center of a star. Now one thing I'm not sure about is why it has to be so close and they would see the interceptor coming. My guess would be it's based on relatively limited um, air-to-air -air missile technology in the 1950s. That was a very new thing, but I can't think of as to why you would have to get that close, because modern air-to-air -air missiles can get you from, from miles away. Um, and granted, this wasn't homing. This, is, this just seems like close-range surprise nuke attack on cluster of enemy bombers, which, granted, that's, that's basically what it is, but I don't know why they necessarily had to get that close. The same year that five men successfully stood beneath Shot John of Operation Plum Bob, the United States started producing some 31... Wait, Plum Bob? Is this where SpongeBob got its name from? Because, like, the Bikini Atoll, there was nuclear weapons testing going on. They live in Bikini Bottom. Are they saying the, uh, <laughs> the fallout and radiation from those tests mutated the animals and created what we see on Spongebob Squarepants, and there's like this little reference here that I didn't just get until now. Let me know what you think about that. I don't know if that's what the writers intended. ...genie air-to-air rockets and attached them to interceptor aircraft at 31 bases across 20 states. The genie would remain in service for almost another 30 years, and secretly, the only nuclear weapon that could be launched in response to an attack without presidential authority. Thankfully, the- That's true, interceptors are fast. You wouldn't want to wait for authority, but I, I never knew of these things. I didn't know they were in service for 30 years. It's crazy. The only genie that was ever fired and detonated was at Ground Zero, Population 5. Yeah. By the late 80s, nuclear strategy changed. It had to. Intercontinental ballistic missiles could now quickly strike nearly anywhere on Earth, and a single one, like the Russian's R-36 warhead, with a 25 megaton yield, could- 25 megatons is ginormous. <laughs> um, most of them don't have that much into one warhead or even a cluster of warheads. I think on average we're talking 400 to 800 kilotons per warhead. Um, some big ones used on bombers are on the order of like 1, 1 1.2, like in, in the case of a uh, B-83 nuke, but this thing was a particular uh, monster, and even though it's only half as powerful as Sarbama, this one was a lot scarier, because again, much harder to intercept, whereas Sarbama would, and went too. I know it's, it's a bit of a meme super nuke bomb, but that was 
it's kind of a joke to nuclear engineers and people who know anything about how to intercept an aircraft. <laughs> but this thing, yeah, you don't you don't want them on ICBMs. Those are a lot harder to intercept. Blast an entire city and spread deadly fallout over half a coast. Oh, he used nuke map as well. That's that's interesting. Yeah, yeah, twenty five megatons on something like that. Mm. No, he targeted he targeted DC. Yeah, I I buy that being a probable target of the Russians for sure. On were the days of relatively slow fleets of bombers that could be stopped with unfocused nuclear fire. The age of mutually assured destruction was here. And we've been living atop the insane geopolitical knife edge that replaced the genie ever since. As for the five men at Ground Zero, they were right. Or at least what they were told before they volunteered was right. Time and distance is what saved them, what made the test a suitable PR stunt. Exploding outwards from a single point, the intensity of a nuclear bomb's pressure wave, ionizing radiation, and scalding heat decreases exponentially with the square of the distance traveled. A warhead... Inverse square law. Doesn't just apply to nuclear physics, it'll apply to... Well, it says intensity, uh, light, uh, sound waves as well. Genies with a 1,000 foot blast radius wouldn't be three times less intense three radii away, it would be nine, nine times less intense. And therefore, with over 18,000 feet between them and a genie out of the bottle, the men would hear a shockingly large noise eventually, but feel little else. And by presumably not spending very much time in the area of any potential fallout, long-term health effects for the men were extremely unlikely. Indeed, records show that every single- Yeah, 18 cubed on the order of several thousand times weaker, so. One of them lived very long lives afterwards. Some lived well into their 90s. Donald Luttrell passed away just eight- Lived longer than a lot of people did back then. Years ago. It's not the kind of time you might expect afforded to you after standing directly below a nuclear blast. That was interesting. I don't know if any of you guys have heard of this test before, but I I never did. It was a great uh, coverage, and I, I knew nothing about nuclear um, air-to-air -air missiles. It's a, it's a fascinating idea. Definitely an old-school thing that we're not, we're not going to see anymore, but it's very much a product of 1950s uh, nuclear weapons doctrine, which is a fascinating piece of history that where public opinion was so, um, they were so pro-nuclear power, they were willing to volunteer themselves underneath nuclear weapons. I mean, man, can you imagine if, if public opinion still had that? There were, there were no nuclear accidents or people didn't care as much about them that we'd have a lot more nuclear stuff, whether it be uh, more advanced nuclear power plants everywhere. We didn't shut as many down. It would... Matt, what a world that would be like. Thank you very much for watching. I'll see you next time.